One time I got a pretty good tip when watching basketball on television. Now, I'm not a huge basketball watching fan, but I do enjoy watching college basketball on TV. And somebody told me, when you watch the game, don't always watch the ball. Watch what's going on around. It was a great tip because it's, it's almost more entertaining to watch what's happening away from the ball than what's happening if you just follow the ball around everywhere. You get to see the other players and how they're setting up for whatever play they're running or whatever defense they might be on. You get to watch the, I like to kind of watch the, the ref that's not following the ball, that's kind of in the backcourt and watch him and what he's doing. I like to now look at the bench and see what's happening on the bench, watch the coaches, watch the players on the bench, kind of get a, an eye for what they're doing. But I also enjoy, and it is a little distracting, watching the crowd. And man, they're so into it, they're just emotions all running wild, you know, with everything that happens, they're just either on top of the world or they're totally depressed. But my favorite scene of all is the free throw when they show the perspective of the player shooting the ball. And there through this see-through backboard is a sea of players, uh, I'm sorry, a sea of fans, and they're all back there, and they're holding those, uh, those noodles, and they're waving them back and forth, and they have these signs, and they're all screaming and jumping around. I don't know how in the world those guys make that basket. Because they are having behind them to see all this distraction. The fans screaming, jumping, holding signs, saying you're going to miss, and all these movements and things going on behind. Somehow, they're able to block it out and to make it most of the time. It shows the power of great concentration and the ability to move forward in what they're thinking, what they're doing, without being distracted. This time of year, uh, the sun really uh, glares when you're trying to drive. And as I've told you many, many times, you all know that I drive a school bus in the mornings. And now, of course, I get up in the morning in the dark and get ready in the dark and drive to the bus garage in the dark. And just about the time I'm driving the bus, the sun's just starting to come up. Now, I'm really into um, the earth and, and how the, the sun moves during seasons of, of the year. And I used to, to mark when I was driving at this certain time of day, I could see the sun here. And then a month later, the sun's over here. And a month later, it's over there. But this time of year, it just seems like the sun rises right in the center of the road, just right there. So I'm driving. I have my hand like this. You know, I've got 60 screaming kids behind me, and I'm trying to see and driving along. It's very distracting. It's easy to, to, to lose your concentration. Of course, there's a science behind this phenomenon. The sun angle becomes lower in the sky. And so it's how the, the trees know it's time to lose their leaves because of the direct direction of the sun uh, during this time of year. Knowing that the end of his life is coming, Paul has these, these last words for Timothy. And as he ends this book of 2 Timothy, he essentially is drawing his focus in to finish strong. Life is distracting. There are people waving noodles in your face. There's the brightness of the sun. Figuratively, as people distract us in our lives, as we get distracted by making a living, obtaining an education, getting our kids to and from school, and wealth building, whatever it is that's a part of building a successful life, if we aren't careful, those things can become so distracting and can veer us so off course that we lose sight of finishing strong in the Christian race, of not letting go of our faith, of finishing the race in a strong way. To finish well. To not become blinded, distracted, and to veer off course. Now with this in mind, let's read these words as we are going to conclude 2 Timothy today. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll begin reading in verse 5. Be thinking of these words now as Paul takes his son in the faith, Timothy. And although he's away from him with distance in this letter, if you could imagine this letter being like Paul pulling Timothy to his side, sitting him down and saying, my time has come, I'm going to die, 
I'm going to be put to death. My ministry is concluding. And I now place my hopes of, of the future of God's work into your hands. Finish well. Finish strong. Don't give up. Endure. Keep going to the end. Fulfill your ministry. So verse 5, but as for you exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Now let's move to verse 16. We'll look at this middle section at the devotional in a while. Verse 16. At my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might fully preach the word and all the Gentiles might hear it. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice here how Paul tells Timothy to fulfill his ministry. See it to the end. Don't give up. And the message for us today, which I'll say here at the beginning while you're mostly awake, is that the message for us is to finish strong, to endure, to not give up on your faith. Continue to the end. See it all the way through. Don't start strong and finish weak. Start strong and finish strong. Endure. Keep going. Fulfill your ministry. Make it to the end. If we look at some version comparisons from fulfill your ministry, fulfill the duties of your ministry. Carry out the full commission that God gave you. Leave nothing undone that you ought to do. Do a thorough job as God's servant. And of thy ministration, make full assurance. These various translations all illustrate beautifully this idea of finishing strong, enduring, fulfilling your ministry. You know, suffering together in adverse conditions builds closeness. Now, I was never in the military, but for those that I've talked to who are, there is just some bond that cannot be measured by those who have fought together in combat. It's unusual, it's unique, it's intimate, it's protective, it shares uh, tragedy together, suffering together, death together, and all the things that go in, in being in battle, but there's a certain kind of bond that is forged by being together in battle. And Paul and Timothy have a, a kind of bond because not only did they serve together in ministry, they were persecuted together, run out of town together, uh, oppressed together, all for the sake of Christ. And in all this work together, there's this bond that forms between them. And in addition to that, we have this intimate relationship of a father and son, a father in the faith and a son in the faith, as Paul has taken on Timothy as his son in the faith. And so Paul draws his personal letter to a close and he casts Timothy's eyes into the future and says, now I'm depending on you. God's depending on you. Jesus is depending on you. Keep going. You can do this. Fulfill your ministry to the end. Finish the race. Let's consider these points then in today's lesson. Paul begins by saying, the time from my departure is close. You know, the nearing of the end of life has a way of bringing the most important things to the surface. Now, I promise you I don't do this to exploit her because I love her. But I have a very special memory with regards to Joan Campbell. 
I love Joan so much. I miss her. She had cancer. She suffered without much complaining with her cancer. I remember when, when she lost all of her hair and it grew back in. It was real fuzzy and soft. And uh, she'd let me touch her hair, you know, so soft, like a little kid, I guess, touching her hair. But the reason that I bring this up now is I have a very special memory with Joan, one that I haven't had with too many. When she was in hospice and she was about to die within a few days, she had a day when she was very clear in her mind. She was in, in very good spirits. And I went over to the hospice house and asked everyone else to leave the room. And Joan and I just had a talk about her future. About what the next step in her life was going to be like. She spoke about the regrets of her life, the good things in her life. But mostly, we spoke about heaven. She knew her time had come. And now her mind was not filled with her property, her car, her house, the little trinkets she had in her home. All of her thoughts were about her future. There's something that draws our minds to Christ when the end is near. And as Paul realized that the time for his departure was coming, he makes sure that Timothy knows what's really important and to not be distracted by the styrofoam noodles that are waved in your face, but to know that serving Christ, loving him, and finishing the race is what matters most. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and my time for my departure is close. Paul uses the metaphor of the cup of wine, the drink offering, poured out by the Jewish priests at the end of a blood offering in the temple. The main part of Paul's action, his ministry, and his journeys is over, and the concluding act is at hand. Paul has no sense of regret over this, and we get the impression that the conclusion is fitting at the right moment. And chosen by God. The word departure that he uses here refers most often with the idea of loosing the ties of a vessel which is ready to depart. Take off the, the, the mooring ropes. It's time for the vessel to move out. Or to untie the yoke that's been on the animals working together. Their work is done. They're sailing off. It's time for them to rest. The end is near. There is a departure about to happen. And so then we have these three very active words that Paul says. Fighting, finishing, and keeping. They're action words. They're filled with effort. And he uses these, these very well uh, thought out ideas that he developed many times in his writings. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. As if Paul is saying, now you do this. Timothy, you do this. Fight the fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. It's my prayer for you. It's the baton I'm handing to you that you will do this now. To not be distracted, but to finish well. Paul has often used these three metaphors in illustrating the Christian experience. Go to the next slide, please. Fight the fight. We're in a real struggle. We'll, we'll look at this in more in a moment. Finish the race. We are in an endurance race. Those who train for an endurance race train differently than a sprint race. Different. Sprint races exert as much energy as you can in order to finish fast. The endurance race is keep back some energy. Don't run out of steam too soon. This is a long distance race. And when Zachary used to run cross country and I would watch him, at the beginning of the race, everybody was even. All of them, hundreds of them would all be running off together. They're all equal. 
None of them are getting ahead of the other, all running. After a mile, different. After two miles, much different. After three miles, those guys are strung out over a long distance. Because an endurance race is different. And so as Paul urges Timothy, he says, this is an endurance race. Make it to the end. Reserve some energy for the end. Keep the faith. We must not be diverted, distracted, or dissuaded. If you think about then fighting the fight, it brings our minds to uh, the fact that we are in a battle spiritually. Mark my words, Satan does not want you to go to heaven. He wants to trip you up and me up. He wants to distract us. He wants to keep us from finishing. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having prepared everything to take your stand. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. It's a battle for my soul and for yours. One in which we must allow Jesus to win in our lives. Fight the fight. Secondly, the second metaphor or idea he uses is about the race. Finish the race. There isn't a first place a second place, and a third place. There's only winners who complete the race. Run in such a way to win the prize, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. The key idea here is pacing yourself to finish the race. Run to finish. Keep going. Keep putting one foot in front of the other and don't stop. How many people do you suppose become Christians who don't finish or who've given up or who quit running? Let's not, that, let's not let that be us. Keep putting the next foot in front. Keep going. Keep moving forward. Finish. Don't stop. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When I read this, I see Jesus at the finish line. He's blazed the trail, he's set the course for us, and he's there cheering at the end saying, come on, you can make it, don't stop. Make it to the end, let's go. Cheering us to the end as we run with endurance. It's an endurance race. Keep the faith. Remain faithful. Don't quit. Repent often. Return continually. Come home. Keep going. Conquer discouragement. Don't let go of faith. Don't let an unkind word said by someone in this room keep you from finishing. The finish is too important. Keep going. Keep the faith. Everyone who has been born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Protect it, cherish it, grow in it. Let's sing the first verse of this song. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven.
Number three, the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. You see, here is the end result of keeping on go of keeping going. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but for all who have loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing? This is not a statement of arrogance by Paul. This is the assurance that is in Jesus. It's not, well, I've run the race, I deserve the crown. It's, I finished the race. Jesus gives me the crown. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, which is our scripture reading for today, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in, such, in this way that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. There is a crown of righteousness then for those who finish who finish well, who endure to the end. Paul is rightly aware of how much he has changed. He knows that these changes did not come from himself, but from Jesus. He is humbly aware of his past and seeks not to hide it. This is a faithful saying, worthy of acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. For I am the least of the apostles, he writes in 1 Corinthians, that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul realizes he's finishing not because of what he has done, because of what Jesus has done in him. I like this next statement. It kind of skips out of the text to me. May it not be counted against them. Paul writes to Timothy, at my first defense, no one stood by me, stood all by myself. But what a mature attitude and one that I hope to adopt into my life that does not hold offense against other people. It's so hard because I want to be offended when people hurt me. I want to be offended when people don't stand by me. I want to retaliate when someone denies me or doesn't stand with me. And Paul here, as those who've gone before him, particularly Stephen, do not hold this against them, and Jesus, they know not what they do. We see here Paul, Paul adopting the same attitude that I want to adopt, and that is that even when I stand alone and everyone deserts me, that I'm going to have the attitude, Jesus stands with me, and that's enough. And I'm not going to hold the things that people do against me, against them. I'm not going to. I refuse. It is a beautiful attitude. It is free from revenge. It is free from anger. It is free from bitterness. It is the attitude seen in Jesus and in Stephen and one that I want to adopt for myself. Because it's easy to be offended and we could spend our whole lives bitter because of what people have done to offend us. And what an attitude to say, even if people offend me, I'm going to not hold that against them. Like Jesus, many other God-inspired people before us who have been persecuted and put to death for their faith, Paul does not want the friend deserters to suffer for their lack of courage. May it not be counted against them. And finally in this morning's lesson, the Lord stood with me. Verse 17, but the Lord stood with me. Everyone else deserted me. I'm not going to hold it against them. Jesus stood with me. And that's enough. He strengthened me so that I might fully preach the word and all the Gentiles might hear it. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. I almost was consumed 
but Jesus saved me. When all others abandon us, God is still there. God is always there. We just need to open our eyes of our hearts and souls to find his loving stillness. When you feel alone, you aren't. And when we feel that we're running the race alone and there's no one there to cheer us on, Jesus is there. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Whatever the exact date of, of Paul's death, we don't know for sure. But Paul's faith is so strong that he does not say, I pray God will bring me, or I hope God will bring me, or God may well bring me into his heavenly kingdom, but the Lord will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Now that is a finish line worth pursuing. So today's lesson is about finishing the race. Finish strong. Finish well. Endure. How tragic to run so well for so long and then quit. Paul implores us today, fight the fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. We stand and sing this invitation song. If you'd like to respond this morning, will you come?